church. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> this is our second service at Grace and Truth Bible Church. I'm Pastor Gary Glennie. Thank you so much for joining with us. All those who are here live and in person, I guess we're live. Anybody? I don't think we have any corpses. Else. And uh, those who are all over the country and in various parts around the world. So uh, thank you so much for joining. I consider it an honor to be your pastor to communicate the truths of the Word of God from the original languages. And so if you're interested in serious, in-depth Bible teaching, you are at the right place at the right time. And so welcome aboard. Uh, we had just those couple announcements at the first hour, if you were with us, and uh, they were, of course, there's two movies out there. The one is The Forge, and that is F-O-R-G-E. It's kind of a discipleship movie. They do an excellent job of uh, teaching in terms of discipleship. It's not overstated or understated. It simply presents the clear gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a great dramatic presentation, very believable, and uh, I think you'll really enjoy it. It's by the Hendricks Brothers. They put out The War Room several years ago, I believe, and uh, that was another great film. So there are some great movies out there, uh, not a lot, but a few. And then after that, there's uh, one Judy and I just saw. I think it's still in. It's Reagan, and it talks about and presents the whole life of Reagan, kind of the high points. And for, even though most of us are familiar with the life of Ronald Reagan and his ministry, nevertheless, uh, some of the things that uh, he was involved in I had forgotten, so it's kind of interesting to go back and hear them. And uh, just, uh, just a wonderful portrayal uh, by uh, Dennis Quaid, just did a great job. It's kind of hard at first to see him as Reagan, but he did a good job. You know, it's kind of hard when you're taking a person, especially someone that you're familiar with. You know, if you portray George Washington, who remembers except what he looked like on the dollar bill? You know, but when you have uh, a person that was in your life and you see him, you go, that's not Ronald Reagan, that's an actor. But as the movie progressed, uh, you got to believe him because he certainly had the mannerism and just did a great job of presenting. So if you have a chance, I hope that you will go see the Forge, F-O-R-G-E, and uh, Reagan, uh, two great movies that are out uh, right now. So uh, that's uh, what I wanted to present there. Uh, remember, at Grace and Truth Bible Church, we teach the whole Bible, every verse in the Bible, every time, all the time. And if you're interested in serious, in-depth Bible teaching from the original languages, you're at the right place at the right time. So thank you for joining with us this morning. And uh, we always take a few moments, as you know, for silent prayer. This gives you the opportunity to acknowledge any sins that you're aware of to the Father. The Holy Spirit, of course, convicting us, bringing to our remembrance, as he does the unsaved. But we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and so he causes us to recognize any personal sin that we have committed, whether mental or verbal or overt, so that we can acknowledge that sin and have restoration of fellowship so that we can understand the Word of God, Bible doctrine, and begin to fulfill what is necessary in our Christian experience. And so 1 John 1, 9 clearly says if we, that is believers, John includes himself, confess our sins, that is to name them, cite them, agree with God that they're sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, they've been judged on the cross, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that picks up the ones we forgot about or just didn't know we had committed, and therefore we believe that that restores fellowship so that we can understand the Word of God. So with that in mind, and in preparation for our study in this second hour, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for your word that lives and abides forever, your word that instructs us about who and what you are, your magnificent plan for us, your salvific work through, your son Jesus Christ and his substitutionary, atoning death on the cross of Calvary. All of these things and many, many more things that help us to navigate through the cosmic system and live above the world in terms of our understanding and have a biblical worldview. Help us to do that as we study in the second hour this morning, that we might be edified of soul, challenged and motivated by the things we study. 
We pray it all in the matchless and powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved, casting all your care on him, for he cares for you. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he will bring it to pass. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word in this second hour to Paul's epistle to the Philippians, chapter 1 and verse 27. If you were here in the first hour, we spent some time going through that verse, and actually it's a rather lengthy verse. We noted several features. Twice in verse 27, we have the word gospel. We noted that the epistle that Paul wrote to the Philippians contains nine references to the gospel. He even closes out twice in the fourth chapter dealing with the importance of the gospel. A number of times in chapter 1, and of course uh, two of those are right here in verse 27. So the importance of the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be overstated because Paul felt that it is significant. It is the quintessential element that allows us to have fellowship with God and to have everlasting life. A clear understanding of the gospel is what Paul desires for all of us and all of his constituents in his day, as well as his Pauline team and their understanding of that gospel. We have spent a great, great deal of time looking at the doctrine of the gospel in the New Testament and, of course, salvation in the Old Testament as well. So we've looked at the means of salvation and the distraction and, the, uh, and those things which come against a clear presentation of the gospel. We noted that today, sadly, in many churches and even in many evangelistic presentations, the gospel is muddled and is unclearly presented. We always, at the close of every service, present a clear message of the gospel so that people can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and gain everlasting life and forgiveness of sins. More about that as we go along, and we begin every class, as you know, with prayer, as well as at the end of every service to close in prayer. We have the prayer of confession to make sure at the beginning of our service that we're in fellowship, able to take in the Word of God and understand to be able to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have an outline at the website, Grace and Truth Bible Church, there's a home page, and at the top of the home page, there's a drop-down menu for charts and graphs. It has maps, outlines, all sorts of helps for your own Bible study. We have an outline there as well. And in our outline, we're in the section dealing with Paul's solemn exhortations to this church, a great church in the first century. He notes that as he talks to them, so great, in fact, that they were one of the chief supporters of Paul in his later ministry and more than one time sent gifts of grace to provide for him so that he did not have to use his bivocational work of tent making uh, uh, to any great extent later in his ministry as early on he did. So in verse 27 of chapter 1 of Philippians, we noted the first part of the verse, and this section continues from 27 all the way through the end of the chapter. And so these two verses are really one sentence, and then 29 and 30 is another sentence. We have noted other classes that the Bible is written and broken up for you into chapters and verses. These do not necessarily sync uh, with the actual sentence structure, many times multiple sentences, two, three, five, a dozen sentences, or actually verses, are part of one sentence. So here, 27 and 28 are one sentence. 29 is a complete sentence, even though it includes, as this does, two verses. So we're in the midst of verse 17, and we got as far as standing firm. We spent some time there looking at this concept of standing firm. We note it even in our songs. We have a song, Standing on the Promises. The idea that as believers, we need to stand firm on the Word of God. That's our basis for everything that we do in life. It's our basis for belief. It's our basis for relationships. It is the strength that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ by understanding His Word. The verse began, as we note, 
only conduct yourselves in a worthy manner or a manner worthy of the gospel. There's our first reference to the gospel. We noted the word conduct, conducting yourself here, was an interesting word different from the normal word that we find in Paul's writing. Peripateo is the normal word meaning to walk about, as they say in Australia, a walkabout. And it's usually translated as the way of life, the manner of life. And we have the same thing here, but a different word. And we find the verb polituma, from which we get the word polite or politic. And it has to do with the world outside, the unsaved world. Therefore, we need to conduct ourselves in the Christian way of life towards the outsiders, particularly in the area of giving a clear presentation of the gospel as he is talking here in verse 27 mentioning it twice that we walk in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ Paul talks in Corinthians of those who teach another gospel or who teach another Christ we've addressed all of those issues this is the Jesus Christ of scripture Jesus Christ as undiminished deity perfect and true sinless humanity and the one who died on the cross for our sins. That is our Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. When you believe, you have everlasting life, forgiveness of sins, and a host of other blessings. And so he says that uh, he is looking forward to coming to see them. But he says, regardless of the fact, whether I'm absent or present with you, so that I can hear and, of course, he is sending his emissary to get uh, information, probably Timothy, uh, to find out how they're doing. And, of course, he wants to know that they are standing firm in one spirit. Standing firm, of course, is the concept we noted over in Ephesians. As we put on the full armor of God, we need to stand firm against the trickery, the deception of the devil obviously in the cosmic system. So stand firm on the principles, stand firm in the word of God, uh, taking the full armor of God as Paul teaches in Ephesians chapter 6. And so we see here that he says standing firm in one spirit. Now standing firm is a participle indicating ongoing activity or action in present time. And so uh, we find here that uh, the standing firm uh, let's see, I'm sorry, that's not a participle, but it's the present tense. Present tense, again, showing ongoing action. Paul uses so many participles, I uh, presume that it was translated here, standing firm. But it says, so that you will stand firm, the, in present tense, indicating that the believer will do this almost in imperatival present tense, used in an imperatival sense, that you all stand firm. It is in the imperative mood, which is command, over in Ephesians. Twice Paul used it that way over there. In one spirit, we looked at a number of passages there uh, in uh, Ephesians, uh, as well as Philippians 4.1 in the next uh, chapter, two chapters further on, and uh, one great passage in 1 Corinthians 16.15, if you were here, in one spirit, uh, the idea here is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that one spirit. Some would think of a generic spirit, that is that we're unified in our thought pattern, but he talks about that a little bit later in the next phrase, with one mind, and therefore we have a spirit, which is one Holy Spirit, and uh, one mentality of the soul. One last one over in Ephesians chapter 4, 3 and 4. We didn't do that one in the first hour. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. And this is because here we find, uh, as we looked at in Ephesians recently, two concepts of unity that we're to have as believers. One is the unification of God the Holy Spirit, the unity of the Spirit. Secondly is the unity or the unification of the Word of God. We share the teaching of the Word of God in unification with all the saints believing the principles of the Word of God under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3 and 4, it says this, being diligent to persevere 
or to preserve the unity of the spirit. And they'll, they've capitalized it there because even the commentators recognize this is the Holy Spirit. And so the unity of the Holy Spirit, not just getting along in terms of the uh, uh, ideas or philosophies, but rather in the unity of the Holy Spirit in the bond of peace. In fact, he further, pardon me, further emphasizes it in verse 4 when he says, because one body, or there is, which is supplied, not in the original, but implied by the text, there is one body and one spirit. The one spirit, again, the Holy Spirit, just as also you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So within that, uh, the escutcheon, or the shield of the royal family, we find all three members of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, the unity of the Spirit, and then, of course, we have one Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, and then one God and Father uh, over all and through all and in all. So we have this unity of the Spirit. And then as we close, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> as we close the first hour, uh, we said that this is uh, in conjunction with one mind, in conjunction with one mind. We have here the uh, word mia, M-I-A, which is the word in the Greek for one. Uh, we learned this in first year Greek. I remember uh, one of those things that we kind of memorized called haste me a hen. <laughs> haste me a hen. Haste and then mia and then hen. Haste was the masculine for the cardinal number one. Mia is the feminine for the cardinal number one. And hen, not a chicken, but hen is the neuter form of one. And so to remember those for a Greek test that I had in first year Greek, haste me a hen. That means one. It's a descriptive uh, name of the three forms, masculine, feminine, and singular, for one. So here we have the feminine because it's going to refer to the noun, which is in the feminine. And they translate it as mind, which is not totally incorrect, but actually the word is suke, which is the word soul. So we would say that with one soul, well, how do we as believers join together with other believers with one soul? Well, the idea is each one of us has an individual soul. How is it that we have a collective soul? It's the mentality of each of our souls that is joined together with other people in the uh, church, local church, and church universal. So basically, we have one mind, uh, and so we have the preposition haste, which is different from the other word for one. It's hard. It's interesting because they're spelled the same, but the accent is different. Haste is one, and ace is into or unto or with. The instrumental here of association would be translated this way. We all are to have in the body of Christ one mind, or better still, one mentality of the soul. In other words, we're to think alike. Well, obviously, within the church, we have all sorts of thinking going on. We have disagreements within the church. We have disagreements with people everywhere, all the time, out in the world. But Paul's desire is that we stand firm in his Holy Spirit, with one mind, that would be the mentality of the soul focused on the Word of God, that we have one mind with regard to the Word of God. <coughs> Pardon me. Some days I don't have any trouble, and other days I do. <coughs> Paul had a thorn in the flesh, and we believe it was eye infirmity. <coughs> I think I got a thorn in my throat. <laughs> At any rate, <coughs> we'll deal with this. Um, <clears throat> pardon me for coughing. With one mentality of the soul, unified together. The same word is found over in Acts chapter 4, 32. Just for a moment, turn over there to Acts chapter 4. Thirty-two. Now, it's used similarly here. The book of Acts is written by Luke, who also wrote the gospel, you know. And here he says in verse 32 of Acts chapter 4, And the congregation, that'd be all, the congregation of those, what? 
who believed, that is, they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, means of salvation, faith alone, in Christ alone, and the congregation of those collectively who believed, past tense, were of one heart and soul. That is to say, they had one heart. Here the heart is referenced to the mentality, and one soul as the collective thinking united together with other members within the congregation. One heart and one soul, the same emphasis as is in our passage in Philippians 1.27, part C, that is that they think alike, and not one of them claimed that anything belonging to him was his own, but all things were in common property to them. At this particular time, because the attacks were coming from the Gentile unsaved and from the Judaizers, and so they had to collect their uh, belongings together and support one another. And so we have great power was coming upon the apostles, and they were giving witness to the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, and abundant grace was upon them all. So we have that verse that describes similar action of the congregation collectively having a heart and collectively having a soul, that is, with reference to the teaching of the Word of God. Now, I see that in our passage because it says, with one mind or mentality of the soul, if you please. And then the last part of this, uh, at the end of the verse, in Philippians chapter 1, if I can get back over there, 127, okay, and it says, with one striving together, striving together, that is one of mine, and what are they doing? They're striving together, and this is the participle that I misspoke earlier. This is the participle. Now remember in English, if you had English grammar, back in the days when I went to school, they used to teach grammar. I don't think they do it much anymore, but they used to teach what participles were. And in English, participles usually are like, uh, they are words, verbs that have ing, going, running, jumping. That's a participle. Shows action that you're doing. Running, going, doing, lifting. You can see it like a motion picture. Participle generally speaks of action that's ongoing, at least uh, in the present tense and the imperfect tense. Here we have the perfect tense, and it means that in the past they have been striving with the result that they continue to do it. The perfect tense in the Greek is different from the perfect tense in some sense from the English. In, in English, the perfect tense, usually we say have, have done something. We put the word have or has uh, or had with the perfect tense. In the Greek, you don't need that, but you're indicating action that occurred in the past time but the results continue on into the present and future time. So the perfect tense here with the participle and the active voice showing that these individuals are continually striving. They were striving when they believed and they continue on striving. The word striving is soon athleo. <laughs> yeah, that ought to ring a bell. The word athleo, what does that sound like? Athletics, huh? So soon athleo. The word soon actually means with, with athletic ability. In other words, we are athletes studying the Word of God, and we participate like an athlete in a competitive game. And therefore, we strive together. Let's say we're part of a team, a football team, basketball team. We're striving together. We're athletes together in a competitive situation. The competitive situation, of course, is against the cosmic system. We are part of a biblical worldview, and we're competing against a secular or cosmic worldview. And so we are joint strivers, if you please, those who have one mind shared in common thinking about the Word of God, striving together as a competitive team for the Lord, this local church, the body of Christ, totally and it says striving together, and then it says what? In the faith. Wow, exactly what we would expect to see. In the faith. The word the, the definite article with the word pistis or pistas, means the doctrine, the faith. Faith is the word that means belief. The belief here is the totality or the sum of the things believed in the word of God 
concerning God and his Christ and the plan of salvation. So we're struggling together, having one soul in mind as a congregation, and we're striving here for the doctrine, the faith, but not just any principle of doctrine, the faith of the gospel. So once again, as he began verse 7 in the gospel, that we are worthy demonstrating and honorable with regard to the gospel, so we struggle together with other members of the body of Christ in the local church to present clearly the gospel, that portion of Bible teaching that teaches about the person and the work of Jesus Christ and how you can obtain everlasting salvation. It's similar, of course, uh, to the book of Jude, although Jude, uh, in verse 3 of Jude, said that he really wanted to present the gospel. Well, Paul presents it in no uncertain terms here in uh, uh, the letter to the Philippians, elsewhere, of course, in the epistles to the Corinthians, and basically in all of his epistles. And Jude wanted to do something similar. Let's turn over there just for a moment. The book of Jude is very short, one chapter before the book of Revelation. <clears throat> following the Johannine epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Then we have Jude. And uh, in Jude, uh, I'll start with the first verse and get down there. Uh, Jude, a bond slave of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, that is, James and Jude were half-brothers of the Lord. They were of Joseph and Mary, Jesus only of Mary and the Holy Spirit. So they were only half-brothers. But uh, James writes maybe the first epistle in the New Testament, and Jude probably writes towards the end, before the book of Revelation, near the last epistle, certainly uh, the uh, last of the apostles to write other than John. And then it says here, uh, to those who are the called, beloved in God. So they were believers because they were invited, and they believed they were beloved in God the Father, and they've been kept for Jesus Christ, that is for his return at the second advent, for us the rapture. Then we have the salutation, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you all. Beloved, verse 3, addresses all believers, you and I, but particularly in that first century. While I, Jude says, was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, he wanted to teach about the gospel, just like Paul, you know, and therefore, uh, as he's writing towards the end, he's read the Pauline epistles, and he goes, I want to throw my hat in the ring. I want to write about the gospel, too. But God impressed him otherwise, and he says, really wanted to make a presentation about our common salvation and the gospel. I've added that, of course, but that's there implicitly. I felt the necessity to write to you to appeal that you struggle, there's that athletic struggling again, contend earnestly, struggle earnestly for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. Wow. So he ended up teaching the whole realm of doctrine, although in this short epistle, he didn't get to do much of it anyhow, but uh, that was his desire to teach about the gospel. So this idea of teaching faith, and this is what he talked about here, uh, in terms of this particular, he is going to write and contend for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. Now, the faith includes the entire realm of Bible doctrine, which we would call the New Testament. And, of course, Paul's presentation of the gospel is included in that. And we noted again, if you were here first hour, that six, diff uh, uh, was it six? Yeah, let's see. Nine different times we see uh, the word gospel occurring in this epistle twice here in verse 27. Well, I know you can't hardly believe it, but we finished verse 27. Let's move on. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 28. Actually, only the second half of this verse. And we know that uh, this, the, uh, this sentence, this sentence actually is two verses long, 28 and 29. So in 29, it starts off, and... <laughs> And the conjunction chi in the Greek generally is used as a connective, and here it is a connective conjunction. And basically, furthermore, we might say, being terrified, and but it has the negative, and not being terrified. Oh my, 
what we talked about going out into the cosmic system and presenting the gospel and what happens. Most of us are <laughs> terrified that someone's going to say, I'm not interested. Get out of here. I don't want to believe that stuff. Don't try to convert me to your religion. I've had people do that. I gave a lady one time, uh, I was at the, at the barber shop. And uh, it was a, a lady barber, and she had some lady uh, clients. And I uh, gave coins out to the barbers, uh, the coins that have the gospel message, uh, where will you spend uh, eternity, you know? And I give those coins out, and I was giving them out. And I gave them to this one lady. I said, uh, this is a free gift for you. And she said, I don't want that. And she heard me talking to the other lady about it, and that uh, the coin says basically uh, one died for your, or many died for your freedom militarily, one died for your soul, and then I have the other coin where we spend eternity. I was basically presenting that uh, to the lady that was doing my hair. So I presented this to the other lady, and she literally <laughs> threw it back at I don't want this. You're not going to convert me to your religion. <laughs> Talk about being terrified. I thought she's going to hit me in the head or something. And, and she was just a bit angry. She got angry. And I said, well, it's okay. It's just a gift. I don't want your gift. <laughs> you know, she, was, she was terrified. And so that happens sometimes. And I know she finally, uh, I, I think she had, she was under the other barber that was there. And she was, and finally when she got done, she got done ahead of me because I was with this one lady barber and she left. And my barber, when I got in the chair, she leaned over and said, she's always like that. She's ugly to everybody. <laughs> don't feel bad. I said, oh, I don't feel bad. But there's an example and that may happen to you. You may give a coin to somebody. I did it with the Jehovah's Witness that came to my door. I gave them gospel coins and a business card. And they, oh, we can't take these. We can't take these. Oh, no, no. Oh, no. And I tried to present. And off they stormed down the street because I was a believer in Jesus Christ. Hmm, that should be interesting. Here they were supposedly representing Jehovah, who is my God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet they didn't want to hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ thought that was kind of interesting. Well, not really, but uh, you see how people will reject your message. Do not be terrified, okay? Uh, this word in the Greek is uh, one of those words that almost sounds like spit. I'll have to cover my mouth uh, to pronounce it. Spituro. Spituro, you get it? It starts with P-T-U-R-O. Spituro. Doesn't it sound like somebody spitting in your face? That's the Greek word for terrified, to be frightened, to be intimidated. How many of you are intimidated when you give the gospel to somebody? Or you just don't do it. Just, I don't think I'll say anything. And so you back off because you don't want to be intimidated. You want to, don't want to be paturum. <laughs> All right. At any rate, to be, by the way, it only occurs once in the New Testament. So if you're a first-year Greek student, student, you're never going to see this unless you're right here in Philippians 1.28. It's the only time. There are other words that mean intimidated, but this one, to me, is just, uh, that's why they translate it terrified, frightening. Uh, do not be frightened. Do not be terrified here. Uh, the perfect tense, at any time in the past, don't ever be terrified. The passive voice means that you may be attempted to be terrified by somebody else oppressing you or rejecting you. And the participle is ongoing activity all through your Christian life. Do not be intimidated or frightened. Do not be otherwise terrified in anything. In anything, it says. The preposition en, which means in the sphere, here we have an adverb uh, as a, uh, the idea of the cardinal, and we have a triple word. The triple word in the Greek is medes. Sounds like mede, but it isn't that. M-E is a word for not in the Greek. M-E, me, me. There's another one, ouk, even stronger, but this one is strengthened by the fact that it's combined with two other words. And so me is not. And then we have the conjunction de, sometimes translated but or even. So far we have not even. And then we have henoi, which is the plural uh, in this case, or actually the singular, I'm sorry, made days, uh, the singular neuter in this case. And it is uh, the locative, so it would be translated this way. Do not be terrified in even one thing, not 
even one thing. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Do not be terrified in even one thing. Okay, by who? Well, we've already talked about it. By those opposing, by those in opposition. And we have the verb anti, in English, anti again, and then kami. Kami means to, uh, to lie, uh, to stand, to recline, uh, basically to stand against those who stand against you, who are opposed to you. They oppose you. The perfect tense it indicates any time in the past. If you've had people in opposition, don't let it worry you. Don't let it terrify you. Don't feel bad. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I've given the gospel and I just feel like I didn't do my job because the person didn't come to Christ or they rejected it. Maybe I didn't present it well. Maybe they just didn't like the way I appeared. You know, they hit it at the wrong time. We always beat ourselves up. Don't do that. They're opposing you. And, uh, and uh, you need to get over that. The participle, again, is ongoing action. Which to them, that is their opposition, is indeed a proof or a sign of destruction. It's a sign of their destruction. Because if they do not believe in Jesus Christ, eventually, sadly, they will go to the lake of fire. Now, you need to think about that sometimes. I know I was thinking the other night when I was at the gym, and I was looking at the sea of people working out on their cell phones, working out, talking about all sorts of things. I was thinking most of these people do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Many of them will go to the lake of fire. I need to seek opportunities to minister to these people. And I prayed about it, that God would bring someone and various people, uh, Russell and uh, uh, other folks that, uh, that we have that uh, go to the gym, uh, Rodney and Russell and others in our congregation who work out at the gym to take our opportunities as they're appropriate, but not always appropriate, that we can at least give an opportunity to present the gospel and not to be frightened or to be terrified by those in opposition because when we think about it, their end is destruction if they don't believe in the lake of fire. So we're talking about serious business here. Years ago when I joined Campus Crusade for Christ, we had a, a wonderful pastor. He had a double doctorate <laughs> in philosophy and in theology, if you can imagine. That seems like an oxymoron, philosophy, Bible. But anyway, he had a doctor of philosophy and a doctor of theology. And, of course, he could deal in both areas because uh, those who disagreed in, uh, philosophically, he mm. said he understood that and he could talk their language and bring them back to the Bible. At any rate, he was, he was a pretty incredible guy. And one of the things that he said in the study, I remember to this day, Judy, I told her, uh, he said uh, that uh, when you think about the things of the Lord and the gospel of Jesus Christ, you need to recognize that uh, uh, and be frightened of the fact that you might go to the lake of fire if you don't believe. And, of course, he basically said that, uh, that, uh, that the unbelievers are going to spend eternity in the lake of fire in total darkness and isolation. I don't know if you've ever been to the caves down in one of the Carlsbad and they turn all the lights off. That's total darkness. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine being there? You can't see your hand in front of your face. Absolute total darkness. And you're on fire, but you don't die. That's the lake of fire, people. They're not going to have a party in hell. Hell is the lake of fire. And anybody who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ will spend eternity there. We need to think about that when we say, oh, I don't know if I want to give the gospel. I might be intimidated. I'm a little fearful. You need to think about that where they're going to be without your information. How they may reject it, that's on them, but you've done your due diligence. And so uh, he said, uh, as I continue with Dr. Manfred Gutsky was his name. Never forget Dr. Manfred Gutsky. He had eyebrows that come out like this. <laughs> Just a great guy. And, uh, and he said, uh, you need to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, because you know why? It's a scary business to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a scary business. And if you're a little fearful of the Lord, that'll be all right because it's a scary business. And I've always thought about that, to fall into the hands of the living God at the great white throne judgment and you are depart from me into outer darkness, the lake of fire, forever and ever. What a terrible thing. 
And yet when we talk to the unbelievers and tell them about Jesus Christ, I'm not interested in that. I don't care about that stuff. They eat, drink, and be merry. Yeah, well, someday you're going to die. I don't think about that. And as they get older, sometimes they think about it. But maybe they have uh, not had the opportunity late in life, although God gives them every opportunity to believe in Jesus Christ. We need to avail ourselves of presenting the gospel to those in opposition, which to them, their opposition, is indeed evidence. It's evidence to them or a sign, a sign, but it's a sign, as we know, of destruction. But to you who believe, it is evidence or a sign of eternal salvation, and this comes from God. Salvation is from God. Yes, we have to make a decision to believe, but salvation comes from the Lord. Now, this thing that uh, we're talking about being terrified, we have many, many passages that we have quoted. I've got a few of them here. Uh, just look at one or two. How's our time? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. All right. Let's look at a couple of these. I often quote many of these. Let's look at Isaiah. Uh, obviously, in the beginning of this class, I use those passages in Isaiah chapter 41. The Old Testament is filled with this idea of not being fearful. Yet, what happens? Anything happens in our life and immediately we start trembling. Adversity, illness, cancer, what have you, comes in our life and we become fearful. <laughs> Just giving the gospel causes us to be fearful. Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10. Isaiah 41 verse 10. If I can get there. Right, there it is. It says, do not fear, for I am with you. Different from the King James that I quote, do not be anxiously looking about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand or the righteousness of the right hand or the right hand of righteousness. And so we have this one that I quoted earlier. And then earlier in Isaiah, in chapter 26, verse 3 and 4, Isaiah 26, 3 and 4, thou will keep that nation. And in, in, in it doesn't say nation in the original text. It implies a nation. So I apply it individually for us that we should keep steadfast of purpose. Thou will keep steadfast of purpose in perfect peace. That is, because it or he trusts in thee, reference to those who believe will be in perfect peace. Or in the context, the nation that trusts in the Lord will have perfect peace. Why do we not have peace? Because we do not have a nation that is steadfast in purpose for the Lord. Our nation is divided clearly today and sadly in half. Half of our nation is in the tank for evil. Even 90% or seemingly that many politicians are in the tank for evil in our nation. And it's not because we need to have better politicians. That certainly would be a help. But we need to do something about the evil people and those in the nation who are contrary to the word of God and are not having peace but are angry about everything. You ever notice that many of the people that hate freedom are angry about everything because they have no inner peace? Inner peace comes from relationship with God because he trusts in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord, Jehovah, here it says, for in God the Lord, the Hebrew is Adonai Jehovah. For the Lord Jehovah, we have everlasting rock or strength. Now Jesus Christ, of course, is the rock. He is the stone of stumbling. He's the rock of offense. He's the cornerstone that the chief builders didn't want and he is the rock of our salvation this is a reference here to jesus christ he is jehovah the lord he is the everlasting rock for he has brought low those who dwell on high <coughs> the unassailable city has been brought down he lays it low he lays it low to the ground he casts to the dust the the, the foot will trample it in the feet of the afflicted, the steps of the helpless, so he will deliver. And we go on and on. One more we'll look at here, and then we'll, let's go to Proverbs, a different one. Proverbs 28. 
Proverbs 28, 1. To thee, O Lord, I called. There's a prayer. Calling is prayer. I called to the Lord. My rock, do not be deaf to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. And so listen to the prayer here. Proverbs. I'm in Psalms. Boy, I didn't think that looked right. That's a great verse, but it's not the one I wanted. Okay. I know you're all right there, and you say, Pastor, you're lost. I was. Pardon me. All right, we'll get on the same page now. Proverbs 28. Ah, here it is. The wicked flee when no one is pursuing, but the righteous are bold as lions. Not terrified, bold as lions. The wicked flee when nobody's chasing them. By the transgression of a land, that's our land or any land, many are its princes, those who are in leadership. But by a man of understanding and knowledge, that nation will endure. So sometimes one person can actually make a difference in a nation. We saw that with Ronald Reagan. He made a difference in his tenure as president. Whether or not one man can do it now, I don't know. The populace is so against freedom and our nation that it's just almost too late. I don't know if it is. I hope it isn't. By the way, uh, we've got the, the fact that, uh, oh, let's see, I was going to say something there. Um, oh, man. Thought just went out, but uh, at any rate, yeah, it was about Reagan. Oh, my. Anyway, it's escaped me now. Okay, I think we're out of time for today. Perhaps the thought will occur for next week. <laughs> And so not being terrified in anything by those in opposition, which to them is indeed a sign of their own destruction. But rather to you all, it's a sign that is of salvation. Now the word sign doesn't occur again, but salvation is implied. Salvation is evidence. The fact that you're born again, that you have inner peace and stability, that salvation is evidence to you. And this comes from God. Well, that's verse 28. We'll close out with that one and we'll pick it up there next time in Philippians 127, actually 128, and we'll close, close that out next time. It is interesting that uh, you probably are saying, Pastor, you find an awful lot in one verse. I do. The Word of God is alive and powerful. It is filled and every line, every principle, every precept, is loaded and powerful for our edification and for our stability in this life. Helps to strengthen us and to keep us from being fearful and terrified. Be one who will give the gospel in the appropriate season to anyone who will listen for as long as God gives you breath. Father, thank you so much again for another opportunity, another excursion in your word. Help us to take these things to heart not as things that I have presented as a pastor, but as things that are from you, Father, being delineated from your word so that they can be applied to each of our lives, mine and those who hear my voice, that we might all do those things that are pleasing in your sight, that Christ working in and through us and his Holy Spirit working through us, that we might produce the fruit of the Spirit the dynamics of living the Christian way of life, not only among the believers, but among the world and the unsaved, that we might be freely desiring to present the claims of your son, Jesus Christ, to all who are out there under the cosmic system, under the world system of belief. And Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for salvation. And we pray for that one person here this morning without Christ, without hope, without everlasting life. We want you to know God had you personally in mind in eternity past when he and the Godhead decided with the Son and the Holy Spirit to send the Son into human history. They took a vote, as it were, and they chose the second member of the Trinity to come into human history through the virgin birth to have perfectly sinless life and then to be qualified by that sinless life to go to the cross 
as a true human being, bear the sins of the entire human race, once and for all time, once and for all people. And he did it by dying on the cross for all of our sins. Won't you do it before you leave? For God so loved the world that he gave, he chose, he called his only born son, born of the virgin, that whosoever anybody who would believe in him, believe what? He is the God, man, savior, died for our sins on the cross. You believe that? You will not perish, be separated from you, Father, but rather have everlasting life in the palace. Forgiveness of all sins, a host of other blessings in life and blessings and potential rewards in eternity, all yours for the believing. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. John says in his epistle, he wrote his epistle that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. Won't you do it before you leave? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, thank you again for another study in your word. Thank you for edifying our souls. Lift us up, challenge us this week to reach out and not be terrified by those in opposition, but be bold as lions as we present the claims of your son, Jesus Christ, unto their everlasting salvation. And Father, we thank you for this opportunity to believe these things and to study these things, edify our souls accordingly. And we pray it in the matchless and powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.